Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Ani Pagosian, and I am the Economic Development Coordinator here with the City of Glendale's Economic Development Division. Thank you all for joining us for our virtual Tech on Tap event featured by the City of Glendale and Children's Hospital Los Angeles Kids X Accelerator. Today, you will hear from Zach Weigel, founder of Gamers Outreach, a charity that provides activities to children in hospitals through the power of video games and the gaming community. Zach will be sharing key strategies on how to captivate and persuade your audience as part of your pitch during this interactive fireside chat moderated by David Delgado from KidsX. We encourage you all to ask questions in our Q&A bo chat box after each presentation. Thank you. David, take it away. Thank you so much, Ani, and thank you so much to the City of Glendale for your fantastic support of KidsX. We really appreciate working with you guys uh, and appreciate your, your loyalty and connection to innovation and to the things that are making life better for all of us. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen very quickly, and we'll jump into a little bit of an introduction to KidsX for those of you who aren't familiar. Uh, and then we will cede the floor to our main event and talk a little bit about Tuning your pitch. What is it that can make the difference between something that lands well and resonates with your audience versus something that falls flat and doesn't quite lead to the outcome that you're expecting? So to jump it off, uh, a, a little bit about KidsX. So KidsX is a global accelerator in digital health. Uh, we focus specifically in digital health innovation within pediatrics, and we seek to solve the most pressing problems within that industry. So we're anchored by a consortium of the nation's leading hospitals, uh, both here within the US and then we have several abroad as well. Uh, so we support early stage companies to achieve the business product, I'm uh, sorry, product and business model validation uh, in the product in their pediatric market by executing multiple accelerators and innovation programs throughout the year. And we also facilitate collaboration between our hospital members, those startups and other major players within the industries such as providers, payers, investors, entrepreneurs, such as the one you're about to talk to today, and corporate partners. So we have hospitals, as I mentioned, all around the United States. Uh, we're very proud of the membership that really is the beating heart of KidsX innovation, um, many of which are, are here in California and some in our own backyard. Children's Hospital Los Angeles is actually the hospital that is the parent company for uh, the parent organization, I should say, for KidsX. So we are bred by pediatric hospitals for pediatric hospitals um, and really looking to find the solutions that have not just you know, lasting impact within the healthcare space, but things that really can make an impactful difference on the operations, on the experience, on the, the general overall feeling that people have when they seek medical care at the time of greatest need. So we have three different peers of what we do. Uh, so we run our accelerators, as I mentioned, uh, which are multi-week programs designed to help promising startups at early stages uh, prepare to collaborate with hospitals. It's a very complicated world out there in the hospital space, as Zach would definitely be able to tell you. Um, and so we do a little bit of the navigating and co-piloting uh, with decision-making as people are entering into the hospital space. We also have an opportunity for when there aren't solutions within the startup space uh, for new products to be created entirely uh, through a collaboration with Redesign Health. And then of course we have our KidsX community, the, the hospitals, the investors, the mentors, the guides, the partnerships with groups like the city of Glendale that we have that really you know, create a dynamic space where conversations can take place, where barriers can be problem solved and where the voice of pediatric needs can be elevated. So up to this date, we have run five successful accelerators and actually just this next week, we're starting our sixth accelerator. And of those uh, accelerators, we've graduated 49 different startups and 59 of those have been BIPOC founders and 45% have been female founders, which we're very uh, excited to share. You know, we focus not only on introducing the best ideas, but a diversity of perspectives to really make sure that pediatric care is inclusive and welcoming to people from all walks of life. 
Uh, we have 32 unique member organizations who have piloted with these startups and that has led to 54 active or completed pilots, uh, many of which have confirmed, uh, have converted over to full contracts. So if you're interested in getting into the hospital space, uh, you can rest assured that KidsX is a proven way to not only be exposed to potential customers, but to really engage with them in a way that leads to um, successful business relationships. So that's just a quick overview. Um, if you have any questions about Kids X specifically, feel free to ask them afterwards or message me directly. I have my email at the end of the presentation. But we want to focus the attention right now on why you are all here, uh, which is really focusing on the pitch, you know, how to tune your pitch to different audiences. Uh, just earlier this week, I was looking at a bunch of different articles that have been coming out recently around you know, the perfect pitch deck. And there have been so many things that are guiding startups on what to include, what not to include, but that's just the slides. You know, a slide deck can be a great introduction to a concept that you could send to an investor or that you can share with potential mentors or potential uh, customers. But the pitch is such a nuanced art form that needs to follow that up. And so we figured we'd take a little bit of a deeper dive into what can make a good pitch and what can differentiate it from a pitch that might fall fairly flat. You know, different, the same pitch given to two different audiences isn't really gonna land the same way. And so the nuances there are really the important thing to pay attention to. So we're joined today by Zach Weigel, who is a founder of a nonprofit called Gamers Outreach, as you heard at the beginning, but he also recently has jumped industries completely and has co-founded a pizza company here in Los Angeles. Uh, that brings pizza from his home in Detroit, Michigan, and shares it with the West Coast. And, you know, I can say personally, I had never heard of Detroit pizza uh, before it opened up, and you guys should try it. It is fantastic. So, Zach Weigel, really briefly as an introduction, uh, is the founder of Gamers Outreach, which is a charity that provides activities to children in hospitals through the power of video games and the gaming community. To date, Gamers Outreach programs enable more than 4.5 million moments of play for hospitalized families across 400 hospital and healthcare facilities each year. In addition to video games, Weigel is the founder of Detroit Pizza Depot, as I just mentioned, which is a food company in Los Angeles dedicated to sharing Detroit-style pizza with the world. Weigel has been recognized as a 2019 CNN hero and was named to the Forbes 30 under 30 list in 2017 for his work in games for the health space. Most recently, Weigel and his team won four Clio awards, including one Grand Clio in celebration of a longstanding philanthropic partnership with Xbox. So Zach, it's fantastic to have you. Uh, congratulations for the recent awards. And uh, we're, yeah, we're really excited to have you here joining us today. Thanks, David. Uh, it's exciting to be here and chat with you again. And hello, everyone. Thanks for making time today. Looking forward to talking a little bit about storytelling and making pitches. Fantastic. All right. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen because I think that your face is more important than your face on the <laughs> presentation here. <laughs> so first, if we could just start off with a little bit of a, an overview you know, tell us a little bit about your journey. When did you get started? This is such an interesting space that not many people, an interesting connection that not many people make, you know, gaming and hospitals. So tell us a little bit about how that all came about. Sure. So I've, as you've mentioned, uh, been leading an organization called Gamers Outreach for about 16 years now. We're focused on making entertainment more accessible inside hospitals. And we do that specifically through video games. The reason philosophically we are focused on video games is because we believe video games make play and activities available to kids and families at scale. And what I mean by that is that if a hospital can manage video game devices and video game content across hundreds of rooms, they can allow all kids to have access to activity and recreation simultaneously. Oftentimes, regardless of age, uh, usually a 10-year-old has as much fun on an Xbox as someone like me in their 30s. Uh, and oftentimes, regardless of physical circumstance, we do a lot of work with kids who have had a big surgery or disabilities, um, and games can provide them with access to recreation while they're receiving care. So we're really focused on improving a patient's quality experience in hospitals. Um, and we've existed for a nonprofit uh, for a number of years, 
uh, where we solicit donations and people, uh, we take that money and support hospitals. Uh, that all got started when I was a high school student. I uh, started in Ann Arbor, Michigan. That's where I'm from originally. And I hadn't intended to really start Gamers Outreach off the bat. I had developed an interest in hosting video game tournaments as a youngster. And very grassroots, I was organizing what are now referred to as esports competitions, um, where I was borrowing Xboxes from friends and TVs from friends. And I got really eager and uh, excited to promote these events to my local community. So I was printing flyers, going to local high school parking lots, you know, putting flyers in people's windshields, trying to get them to come to my tournaments. Uh, and I got to a point where like hundreds of kids in my community were participating in my events. Uh, and so I, one event, long story short, decided it would be fun to donate some of the money from ticket sales to my local children's hospital. And that's where I discovered accidentally the hospital was having a hard time providing kids with things to do. And as a teenager, naively, it just seemed obvious to me, well, I, if I was in the hospital, I would want to play video games. Why don't we give the kids video games? And I noticed that the hospital was purchasing Game Boys, like handheld PlayStation portables. Again, this is back in 2007, right? So if any of you are, uh, I don't know what the age group is here today. I should know that that's part of maybe making effective pitch. But if any of you remember those handheld devices, uh, the hospital is basically rebuying those things, you know, as they would hand them out to kids. And as a donor and a gamer, to me, it seemed like if I was going to be raising funds for the hospital, I'd prefer for them to not have to keep buying the same things over and over and over again. So we, uh, I started building this portable video game cart for the hospital. When I was growing up, I had this cabinet in my bedroom that I kept my Xbox and PlayStation inside and it had wheels on the bottom. And it occurred to me as I was like trying to think how could, how could we be helpful to the hospital? You know, if I could build them some sort of lockable cabinet, they could keep all their video games and store them, make them mobile for kids to play. Uh, and so I started building these things that we now call go carts, gamers outreach carts. Uh, there's actually one right here behind me. You kind of see here. Uh, they are portable video game kiosks built for hospitals. So we equipped the very first unit with an Xbox or PlayStation. We did that by sort of repurposing existing medical carts for our intention of playing video games. Um, and the first one was a big hit at the hospital. They were like, can we get more of these? So we would put a PlayStation inside. The hospital would wheel room to room for kids to play games. Uh, and then a neighboring hospital found out what I had done and, and they asked for a gaming cart. And then at the time, I was one of the only people who was really organizing video game tournaments in the country. And again, if you're familiar with the phrase esports or you've seen these big video game competitions, perhaps on, on television or even here in Los Angeles, they happen quite frequently in this you know, side of the country. Um, all of that stuff was brand new. Like video game companies were just starting to organize these video game tournaments really as marketing events. Uh, and so I would have marketing agencies reach out, invite me to Los Angeles. I would help them produce some of their video game competitions. They were looking for someone who could kind of help them organize players and create tournament settings. Uh, and so I would sort of plug into these larger experiential events uh, where, you know, a, a big marketing agency would kind of produce like, you know, this, this big concert, they'd set up the trust, the staging, the lighting, hundreds of Xbox consoles. Uh, and then I would come in and just kind of work on just the tournament part. Um, but I, I, the reason I tell that story is I had industry colleagues who would see me on Facebook post about a gaming cart delivery. And then they asked, uh, hey, you know, is it possible for us to build a gaming cart for Children's Hospital Los Angeles or Seattle Children's? I was like, well, yeah, I guess if a donor comes forward and wants to fund that, we could make it a thing. Uh, and fast forward 16 years, that's pretty much how Gamers Outreach became a full-on organization. We grew initially through just my industry contacts um, in the video game world, uh, just from organic fundraising and events I was organizing back in Michigan. Uh, and then the organization's activity level got to a point where it was consistently interrupting my full-time job, college at the time. And uh, the story I like to tell is, there was one day we had someone try to donate 900 Xboxes to us. And the semi truck showed up at my parents' house and was like unloading pallets onto the driveway. <laughs> and that was the day we got kicked out of my parents' basement. They're like, get out of here. This is not like, you gotta, you gotta get out of the house. This is, this is, it's take, we had already amassed like five or 6,000 video games that people donated and um, in their basement. And, and it was, it was just becoming a lot. So 
Um, yeah, I never thought of Gamers Irish as being a full-time job. I was doing it because it was just coming from a place of um, sincere enthusiasm. I had grown up playing video games. I knew I wanted to work in the video game industry, but didn't think of Gamers Irish as being a full-time thing until it became a full-time thing. Uh, so I would say of the 16 years we've existed, the first seven or eight really was a passion project. You know, it was kind of in the background while I was doing other things. Uh, and then it started taking over my life. And since we've, you know, had to think a lot about fundraising, thinking a lot about recruiting sponsorships. Um, it's interesting now that I've, David mentioned launching Detroit Pizza Depot, we're actually, there's a third start, like stealth startup in the works right now behind the scenes. I was just telling David about actually before our call. I uh, can't share anything yet about it, but we're, we're, yeah, I've done quite a bit of fundraising in the nonprofit world. And now uh, I've done some fundraising for the pizza company. Interestingly, very different in some ways, uh, similar in others. And then we're working on a third pitch deck, literally, uh, I was working on it right before this call uh, for another raise that we're about to do, which is a bit larger. Um, and I think at the core, there are a lot of similarities. You know, I think having a sense of purpose uh, and thinking about a pitch from a perspective of storytelling is quite helpful. Um, and then bonus points, I think what's beautiful in the for-profit world is you're, you, you have the leverage of incentive. People who want to invest are looking for a return. And so frankly, even if the story is mediocre or not that great, if the business you're pitching has really strong numbers, uh, sometimes that's enough to, you know, uh, get people interested and involved in what you're doing. Um, I think bonus points. Uh, and hopefully, ideally, it there's a cool story attached to what you're doing as well. So anyway, I've rambled enough. Uh, that's that's a bit about my more origin. Uh, Gamers Outreach has been my full-time gig for a number of years. Uh, the pizza company was kind of a passion project uh, because I moved to LA in 2016. We have the style pizza back in Michigan. It's very common. Um, and selfishly, I wanted to be able to order better pizza, <laughs> at least the pizza that, that we had back like back home. Uh, and the scene was, um, the scene in downtown at the time was, um, kind of sparse, I thought for, I, I literally couldn't find anyone who's making Detroit style pizza. So now we're doing it. Um, and it's been fun. We, uh, if you're near USC's campus, we have a small kitchen we're renting. Uh, we're open for pickup and delivery. Um, and you can check us out at Detroit pizzas on social media. So anywho, uh, pizza and video games. That's how I spend my time. Uh, happy to, go. happy to chat more. Pizza and video games probably since the beginning, but now it's taken up your entire day. Yes. <laughs> Indeed. So yeah. that's I kind of that was a perfect overview and summary of, of many of the things that we're going to dive into a little bit later in the conversation as well. So that was excellently done. Um, but I want to jump back in time a little bit because you mentioned that you started this very young, back in high school, right? And it kind of spread naturally within the hospitals in the area. And then as the idea turned into a little bit more of a side project, turned into a little bit more of a full-time project, turned into a little bit more of getting kicked out of your basement. Okay, we need to turn this into a company. Has your messaging changed throughout that time around how you, because I imagine at some point it wasn't just word spreading between hospital executives or between social workers, right? It, it, at some point you had to make that shift to, okay, I'm going to go approach this company and give them a, the story, give them the spiel, give them a pitch. You know, how how has that part of your experience changed, I guess, in the past? Have you always been comfortable with pitching? What does that look like? Yeah, I mean, I, a handful of recommendations come to mind. So have I, I guess I'll answer the last question. Have I always been comfortable with pitching? Um, you know, I can point to a few things, I think, that made me more comfortable with public speaking mm. growing up. Um First off, I was in a band at a young age with friends, and there was an inclination to perform. Uh, and I was, so I, I started playing drums as a youngster. Just as a quick anecdote, uh, if, if any of you are parents out there, I want to mention this because I think it's important creatively. Um, I developed an interest in playing musical instruments when I was young. I was playing drums, and I, I was playing drums for about sixth grade, maybe to like freshman year in college, uh, pretty actively in a band with friends. I was in this like hard rock band. We played Celtic heavy metal. Uh, our guitarist also nice. played bagpipes. And so he would switch <laughs> yeah. off a little bit. And I remember the first time, so, you know, when you're, when you're learning an instrument, you, you know, you go into music class and you, you learn a few songs, you get comfortable, at least comfortable enough with an instrument to, you know, uh, play some riffs. And then at some point you just have to start getting in front of people. And uh, Dave Grohl, uh, you know, from Foo Fighters has this great, 
uh, quote I remember once where he's like, you know, when you're when you're in a band, you got to get out in front of people and you you and at first you really suck and you just keep sucking. You're just like you're you're in the garage. Your band is terrible, but you keep playing and you eventually get a little less terrible, a little less terrible until eventually you're you're musicians and you're writing songs that really resonate with people. And I remember one of my first performances uh, where I barely really knew how to play drums, but I just got stuck into an environment where uh, I messed up a ton in front of a bunch of people. And once you have those mess ups, if you continue on and keep playing, you develop a comfort with failure. Uh, you know, hey, if this thing doesn't go right, if my speech doesn't go right, if this pitch doesn't go right, it's okay. There's going to be another day to go fishing later on. And I think that is a huge differentiator between entrepreneurs who ultimately succeed and ones who don't, is quitting. Uh, people who start their own companies or start pitching and get turned down, there's so many case studies of, I mean, movie directors, inventors, people who created that first thing, that first pitch. You really need to take times where things didn't go well as feedback opportunities and mm -hmm. detach a sense of ego and personal offense to how people react to what you're doing. And that way, I like to think of business as art. I actually approach, my approach to business and entrepreneurship comes from a place, I think, more of creative expression than it does of sort of monetary desire, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. Not that money isn't great and you can't do a lot of things with money, obviously, but like, I, to me, I like Detroit Pizza Depot is, is frankly like, hey, selfishly, I want a great pizza and I wanted to share a part of my hometown culture with the city of Los Angeles. Um, sorry, another long-winded explanation here for you. No, this is perfect. It's, I mean, it's just us two. So this is, this is fantastic. Um, on that note, if there's any questions from the audience, feel free again to put them in the chat or just to take yourself off mute and raise your hand virtually. Uh, yeah. We're happy to just have this as a kind of a, collaborative discussion um, with with your questions involved. So and David, real quickly, uh, to, yeah. to just to wrap up this point, I got on my a little bit of a tangent, but the 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 overlying the underlying point I was going to make was just one, if you can enroll yourself in public speaking courses, mm. extremely helpful. When I was throughout high school, I, I had the opportunity to I had a really great public speaking teacher mm. who helped me eliminate ums, stuttering, all sorts of little quirks in my public speaking. And then later on, my high school had like this dual enrolling program where you could uh, knock off part of your high school day to take college courses and they paid for it. I signed up for communication courses. Mm. Getting the chance to do impromptu speeches in the classroom environment, super helpful. And then from a storytelling standpoint, and I, and I, I wanna say that because it, you know, for people who are new to public speaking or new to pitching, it is immensely valuable to find a class and an instructor who can, in a safe environment, help you get comfortable with being in front of an audience. Acting classes probably do something similar. Being a musician might do something similar. Maybe even taking like stand-up comedy courses might do something similar. So I want to say that for those of you who I don't know in this room, you know, where you guys are at in terms of crafting your pitches or if that's even of interest, but that's a great way to get started. As you evolve and you'll learn these things in these courses. For us as Gamers Outreach, we have multiple voices depending on who we're talking to. And David, this is to your kind of the first part of your question. Yeah. If we're talking to hospitals, we take a very institutional approach. The language we use might be more formal. We might say to a hospital, Hi, Child Life Specialist, we're Gamers Outreach. We provide tools that enable therapeutic play in your environment. Now, David and probably some of you on this call know exactly what therapeutic play refers to. The typical gamer has no idea what that means. What therapy? You guys provide therapy to kids in hospitals? Are you a therapy organization? No, <laughs> we're, we provide therapeutic play. When we talk to gamers, we say, hey, we believe the world is better when kids have access to play. Turns out gamers have the power to help. Do you want to get involved? And we just, we just simplify the messaging. We, the simpler you can make the messaging, the better. And this is something that took me a lot of time when I first started learning about hospital jargon, mm -hmm. it was common for me to be very wordy in my explanations of what we were doing. If you were to go back and find 
I'm not sure they're, I'm not sure you can even find them now, but older versions of the Gamers Outreach website had these elaborate explanations around the work we were doing and why it was important in hospitals, et cetera. For attracting donors, none of that really matters a lot. Uh, the general donor, the person who just visits our website and you know is interested in giving because they think it's cool that kids can play video games in hospitals. Our more institutional donors, they might care more. The people providing grants who are a bit more savvy when it comes to you know wanting data and um, want to understand how what you're doing supports patient outcomes, mm -hmm. they're a little more concerned with vocabulary. But you have to have mindfulness and consideration for who is listening to this and how are they going to interpret what I'm saying. If you go look at our Twitter feed, it's pretty rare, it's pretty rare that we get super wordy uh, in terms of like using hospital language uh, very publicly because most of our general supporters are video game enthusiasts. So that's who we talk to. And when we're talking to brands, it's almost a bit of both because brands and marketers, you know, their objective from a for-profit standpoint, of course, is to candidly build awareness for their product, right? Um, and so as a nonprofit, we're sort of in this little bit of a balancing act sometimes where our goal is to help make kids' lives better. And sometimes we play ball with certain brands that, you know, they're, they have to justify making a donation to a charity like ours. And so we might engage them and create, uh, you know, certain types of sponsorship inventory for them mm -hmm. to purchase, if you will, or donate towards so that they get some sort of brand recognition for what they're doing. Yeah. Um, and that always just depends on the brand. So some brands are really great about organically, or at least in a uh, authentic way, connecting with the charity cause. Other brands, there's sometimes we have to tell brands like, you know what, this isn't a fit. Uh, no, I'm sorry, we cannot provide, we cannot promote this type of product in a children's hospital. Um, uh, energy drinks, as an example, we don't yeah. promote energy drinks. In, I'm not knocking Red Bull, you know, as an example, I love, I, you know, drink certain energy drinks on occasion. Uh, but, you know, there's certain things we just don't promote in a children's hospital. We might promote them at like a gaming event we host where maybe we're hosting like a cocktail mixer. Cool. Red Bull vodkas all day for everybody, you know, $20 donation, you, we'll give you a drink, you know. Uh, but in the children's hospital, we don't go down that road. So you just have to kind of know where these things are landing. You mentioned something in that answer that was just, I feel like it's so easy to lose track of. And so many of the startups that we work with, um, you know, we have to work with them pretty intensely on this, which is simpler is better. You know, one of the beautiful things about customer engagement as well is that you often have a couple different conversations before you get to that expert at the deepest level where you need to use all that jargon. That's definitely true within the hospital space. You know, you you pitch to someone who is kind of a generalist. And so you, you know, even though we're there within the hospital space, you can throw in a little bit of jargon, but for the most part, you're still using that overarching, hey, this is what we do. This is the kind of the, the public image of everything that's happening. And then they'll say, oh, that's really interesting. And then they'll loop in people that know more about the gaming space or know more about the therapeutic play space or know more about kind of that, the finer details um, and then you can start to incorporate that jargon. So it's it's true not even within kind of different industries and whether you're going for the public or for the gaming industry or for the hospital industry, but within an industry too, there's so much variation. And so knowing to your point, who you're talking with and doing a little bit of that research beforehand and saying, okay, what role does this person play? Do they know some of this, the detail that I'm gonna be talking about or should we save that for a later conversation? Um, it can be, the difference between, you know, something completely going over someone's head <laughs> and them saying, I don't think we need this. This sounds way too complicated versus just taking it down to the core concept of, hey, you have kids, they're in pain. We have been able to show that playing video games reduces their pain significantly. It's like, great. Oh my God, what an amazing message. Um, and I have to say, when you were in the accelerator last year, uh, our Press Gaming Kids X Accelerator, you did a fantastic job with that always. And our team definitely recognized that. So congratulations there. Um, so you mentioned a couple of fantastic points and hopefully people in the audience are jotting down notes. You know, speaking classes, great idea. Um, acting, you know, performing, just getting out there and making public fumbles <laughs> so that you can, first of all, 
boost your own ego up and separate it out from the mistakes that are made once because you can learn from them and move on to a different one. Another great idea within the startup space, and there's, you know, there are many different startup spaces within Los Angeles uh, County. You know, there's Upstart Valley, which is something that's just happening with um, the city of Glendale and Burbank and kind of the, the, in the valley a little bit. Um, these, these communities, these hubs, they do have pitch practice events where it's often just startups coming and pitching to each other. And so there's not really any invested interest from anybody, but you can just go in front of an audience, do your thing and mess up. And that's what it's designed for. Uh, so for those of you who are in the audience that are interested in, in that sort of thing, please reach out to me uh, or reach or just look in the space uh, where you live, because I'm sure that there are public speaking courses or pitch practice sessions, things like that. I, I really think that's the most meaningful thing someone can do if they're looking to hone a pitch. Um, or, or and, and again, just public speaking broadly, it's very difficult to become a talented public speaker by reading about it in a book. Much more likely you'll gain experience and pick up on little nuances of things you might be doing wrong that you want to correct by getting up on stage and actually speaking. And if you can find a, a teacher or you know someone in the audience, or like a sort of a buddy in one of those workshops who can provide real brutal candid feedback, yeah. it's super helpful. I mean, I'm talking like someone who calls out the ums, the likes, the rambling, you went off topic here, all of it, bring it. And David, you guys did a great job during the Kids X, uh, I thought Accelerator, helping people hone their pitches, giving them those public speaking tips. Super valuable, super valuable to have those experiences and it'll make you a better speaker and much more self-aware. So I, I think that's probably one of the most effective things you can do is actually get up on a stage, talk to people outside of practicing on your own or reading about yeah. it in books. Fantastic. You mentioned earlier about uh, at the in your intro, how there are some things that are similar between industries, some things that are different. I'm curious just to take, uh, you know, gaming, healthcare, and foodies <laughs> and compare those directly. You know, what are some of the things you're, I mean, you mentioned a little bit between the hospital and the, or kind of the hospital administration and then the general gaming community. But when you switch that over to food and, you know, the investors that might be willing to donate to food versus the investors that might be willing to donate to a gaming product, how did you have to rewrite your script and, and redo your approach? You know, it's interesting because so all three of the organizations, I've two of them, I've obviously explicitly stated one of them that's kind of still in stealth. Um, they've all been different in some ways, same in the others. The a pitch for Gamers Outreach as a nonprofit, I feel, is a, an appeal to values. Ultimately, mm -hmm. people are donating to a nonprofit because they share a sense of belief. The thing you're working on is important, and there may not be some sort of profitable outcome for it, but it's, a, it's an imperative to work on. And in that sense, we are trying to find people who believe in creating a world that should exist. I think of nonprofits, my, this is my current viewpoint, ask me again in a few years, we'll see if it changes, but <laughs> my, my current philosophy is I feel nonprofits are great at instigating activity and for-profits are great at maintaining or scaling it. An analogy that I've been thinking on recently is, you know, if you imagine a small village that doesn't have access to clean drinking water, I'm making some generalizations here, but I think you'll get the point. A water bottle company, a water bottle company may not have interest in shipping pallets of water bottles to that small village because there's no economy. The people there, there's not really any sort of transacting happening. They don't even have currency to buy said water bottles. The company would just be sort of taking on an expense and it doesn't happen. But from a humanitarian standpoint, I'm sure most of us can agree, people deserve access to clean drinking water. So we started a nonprofit to go to this community, dig a well and help these people learn to provide for themselves to get clean drinking water. You fast forward a decade after building that well, you find the health of this community has improved. People are living longer, they're having kids. The community has grown. Now the village is a small town. And look, they've built a marketplace that has groceries. 
Now, suddenly, that little grocery store exists. And guess who's mm -hmm. showing up with water bottles? Nestle. So, uh, you know, and I'm not, call, I'm not, again, I'm just using Nestle as an example here. Water bottle company. <laughs> water bottle company, right. We all know Nestle. So the point being is that nonprofit can go in through donations and instigate the activity of building the well. And then once there is a ecosystem in place to support an environment where people, not only are they getting water from the well, but they also want the convenience of having a water bottle. Congratulations, there's a marketplace that exists now for someone to come in and provide for that. So I think when you're pitching on a nonprofit, and this is a, you know, a very surface level summary of an endless topic, nonprofits are about appealing to shared values. They're about purpose. We want to do this thing. We believe it's important in the world. Do you want to join us? Um, when people donate to a nonprofit, usually there's no financial return, right? It's, yeah. hey, I'm going to donate money to you. I get a tax write-off maybe. And hopefully I get a sense of pride and joy for doing this. Um, nonprofits, of course, can do all sorts of things to show appreciation to donors, can host fun events. Um, you know, there's all sorts of activities nonprofits can engage in to really uh, foster a healthy community of people who are giving. Uh, but the message is very centered on purpose. Here's why we're doing this. I think it was helpful in hindsight that I happened to start a nonprofit as like my first entrepreneurial venture, hmm. because it forces you to convince people to give you money where there's no return for them, really. Outside, unless someone has a personal connection to a cause, you know, where they like we have instances where we're working with parents who, hey, their child has maybe benefited from one of our gaming devices, and they're like, we need more of these in the hospital. My kid's still playing on it regularly. His friends want to play on it. Can we get involved? And so oftentimes, again, shared values, maybe there is some benefit to the donor where they're, you know, someone they, uh, you know, someone they're in the hospital with, per, in our case, is directly benefiting from our programs, of course. But ultimately, it's a, it's a selfless act. When they leave the hospital, that device will exist and, you know, hopefully support other patients. Yeah. Um, in the for-profit world, and this is, goes back to what I said earlier, the added angle is that you're, again, working with incentive. And if you can, if you're starting a for-profit or an entrepreneurial journey, and you have a powerful story around what you're trying to accomplish, and by the way, there's a chance this could make money for somebody, that is a double whammy. And I feel like a lot of founders spend time. Here's our thing. It solves this, you know, it's going to do this and it'll make you X amount of money. Would you like to give to us without taking a little bit more time to establish some context and mm -hmm. enthusiasm and passion for why they're doing what they're doing. I believe we should live in a world where video games are fully integrated with hospitals. And I am committed to spending <laughs> the rest of my foreseeable future on solving this problem. We should live in a world where one day we all look back and ask ourselves, remember when hospitals didn't have video games? That's the vision we're trying to paint at Gamers Outreach. And that's language that I spent time coming up with to demonstrate, illustrate the point and the end goal of what we're trying to do. And you, with your unique widget or thing you're doing, want to try to spend time finding your unique voice and your unique language that is relevant for what you're building. Um, so I think going through that exercise is, is very important and something that you might even struggle with initially. So if you're uh, making your first pitch deck, I find talking to investors, sometimes you have an idea of what you want to convey. An investor <laughs> will ask you two extra questions you didn't think about. Great. Maybe if you don't have the answer in the, that pitch necessarily, but you can say, you know what? I don't have an answer for you right away. Let me come back to you and, and get back to you later. So if you can have like a little bit of a playbook, and again, you'll, you'll have these experiences and you'll have to figure this out to some extent on your own. But if you're aware, if an investor asks you a question that you didn't prep for, having a little playbook where, okay, if that happens, I'm going to use this line. You know what? That's a great question. I don't actually know the answer right now. Let me follow up with you and get that information for you because it is, maybe it is important to what we're doing. And every time you do that, eventually, you know, you'll talk to like your first five investors They'll ask you, they'll each ask you some shared questions, and then they might each ask you a question that's a little different than what you've been asked before. 
Ultimately though, you keep adding those things to your pitch deck. And then by the time you're talking to investor number six, seven, eight, nine, ten, guess what? No one's asking you new questions. In fact, now you've got all the answers and your success rate is going to be that much higher, most likely if you weren't successful before, because now you're more prepared. And so that goes back to what I was saying earlier about accepting failure. It's not really failure, it's feedback. You're in the, pro I mean, you think about SpaceX just launched, you know, their huge rocket for Mars. It, you know, it blew up, but that wasn't, that was almost intentional. Like they weren't expecting to, you know, like land everything successfully. We're going to get to this point and then we're going to learn from it and rebuild. Someone posted a similar video of like military airplanes. The majority of test flights for military airplanes fail their first times. Mm -hmm. And they take all the data, they build the next plane. And thankfully, test, a lot of times test pilots survive thanks to safety measures, but there are people who are crazy enough to get in these machines and try them out. Uh, and they have to, you know, eject quite often, you know, when they're making those first flights. So you messing up a little bit on a pitch deck or ruining it with an investor, there's going to be another investor. There's, there's plenty of investors in the world. And this is something you start learning as your level of productivity and activity increases and you get better at delegating and finding a team to support you. It's, it's, it, if you'll start learning and realizing that the opportunities to pitch and engage with others, if you mess up once still exist elsewhere, hopefully. Um, the food scene is different than, so video games, first off, I, I think the, and sorry, David, this is more direct to your question. Again, I, I get excited. And totally fine. It's all things. fantastic kind of addition to this, to this picture. I, I think the industry you're raising for certainly is, uh, is going to influence the amount of money you can probably command, I imagine. Mm. Part of that depends on who you talk to, how enthusiastic they are about the space. And then part of that depends on probably the industry itself. So there's not, you know, situationally, this might be different for everyone. In, the, in my experience so far, video games are, I believe, an easier sell because look, software, you know, massive scale potential, right? We all know. Physical products are kind of difficult. Physical manufacturing is a bit more difficult. It's a lot of upfront investment to build a physical thing. Uh, whereas with software, you build it once, sell it twice, right? And so um, the appeal to investors for that reason, um, you know, it tends to be uh, more palatable for them because they're used to, you know, seeing tech companies with huge valuations and such. Pizza, honestly, I feel, and I say this, you know, as someone in the pizza industry, I feel like pizza is kind of like a very, my co-founder hunters or chef might disagree with me saying this, but I feel mm -hmm. pizza is a fairly basic business to start, right? You think about like every marketing class, you probably use pizza as the example of, okay, you make a thing, put it in a box and sell it to people. Let's create a marketing plan around this, right? Ultimately it's marketing distribution. You, we do make a really great pizza. Our unique differentiator from a product standpoint is that it's hard to find Detroit pizza outside of Michigan. Um, but the deeper purpose behind what we're doing in my mind, and I sincerely mean this is I am here in Los Angeles because I love the entertainment industry. I love Los Angeles. I love the culture of LA. I love the sense of ambition in the city, the diversity, you know, I feel LA is this place. It's a magnet for people who want to work on creative projects. And what it, you know, what happens is we have all these different people from different walks of life, folks who've grown up here. Then we have people who've moved here uh, from wherever they came. And everyone is sharing a piece of their culture with everyone else who lives in the city. And for me, starting Detroit Pizza Depot was a way to share a piece of Michigan, a piece of where I grew up with the city. And so it feels like to me, this is a part of our storytelling. We want to let people know this is something amazing that comes from Detroit and we want to share it with you. Would you like to have a slice? And I think there's another piece of that patriotically, you know, growing up in Michigan, Detroit, you know, has needs to, <laughs> Detroit needs to re-earn some reputation points. At what mm -hmm. At one time, Detroit was one of the wealthiest cities in the country, was putting on the world on wheels, automotive industry was a powerhouse. And then there was all sorts of things that happened in the city that caused a mass exodus. Detroit had millions of people living in it at one point, and then it went down to a few hundred thousand uh, because jobs, uh, auto industries closed, there was racial tension, all sorts of things. You can go back and look at the history. Now it's having a comeback. There are companies that have moved back to Detroit. There's a very strong art scene in Detroit. There's a very strong um, sense of entrepreneurship and food in Detroit. And growing up in Michigan, a lot of us didn't realize this pizza that we've 
just all assumed, I guess, existed elsewhere, actually doesn't. And so it's to me, it's something that I think deserves to be shared with the world. It's my way of trying to give back to the place where I grew up and saying, listen, Detroit has a, a, ma a wonderful story to tell and it's on the comeback. So there's a little bit of a patriotic thing there. We want to try to help Detroit's brand equity a little bit. And so, um, you know, we want to do that through food. And I think food is a strong way to build community. Um, yeah. Ultimately, if you start a restaurant, restaurants aren't really known to be the most profitable endeavors, right? Again, compared to software. What they are, are great networking hubs. I mean, if you start a great restaurant, you have all sorts of people walking through the doors from different walks of life um, that you might not have ever met otherwise. And I think that's what's really cool about food is that it's sort of like, it's a foundational activity that we all have to engage in, right? We're all, yeah. it's rare to meet someone who doesn't like pizza. Uh, usually you might differ on variations of pizza, vegan, gluten-free, et cetera, but um, you know, it's, it's a connecting point. So um, the stories are different. Hopefully it was implied, at least in some of what I was saying, you know, industry to industry there. Yeah. For-profit video games, probably very easy sell. Food, community building. Hopefully if you can be profitable in food, great. Um, our first goal in the pizza company is don't lose money and eat for free. So that's objective number one. Uh, objective number two is multi-million dollar pizza make a corp. So we'll see if we get there. But ultimately, um, I'm just happy that it exists. And I think sometimes that's, again, back to the... The reason you might want to start a business may not necessarily be from totally, you know, some, you know, point place of 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 greed or self totally selfish ambition. It might be more artistic. Maybe it's you just want to see a thing exist in the world. And somebody phrased this to me once: a company is a group of people who all agree that thing should exist. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a healthy way to frame it. I like to frame entrepreneurship sometimes also as you you creating solutions to problems you want to see solved. Uh, you know, sometimes people frame that as find the thing you're passionate about. I would maybe frame it as find problems you're interested in solving. Um, and usually yeah. your, yeah, your sense of commitment will be stronger in there. That's great, yeah. You do something, I, uh, probably just because of rehearsing, uh, you do something with all of your stories and your kind of your example pitches that you give that is such a key factor to a successful pitch as well. Um, in the story around, you know, your pizza and talking to people about pizza, you end with, do you want a slice? When in your story, ask, uh, talking about reaching out to gamers, it's, you know, hey, we have this beautiful vision. Do you want to join us? There's always an ask there. And that's the last thing is, is a welcoming ask to do something or to receive something. And that's, that's a huge part of a pitch as well is, you know, with it, whether it's, uh, to someone that you're looking to work with, you know, what would that look like? What is that ask there? If it's a, to an investor, what is the ask? How can they help you? What is the financial, you know, what is the price? What is the equity? Whatever it is, but the, the ask can be both structured into your presentation, but then also ending with it is, is a very strong way to kind of make an open door and say, hey, this is this is what we're doing. We think it's fantastic. This is why you should think it's fantastic. Want to come along? You know, and it's an it's an invitation to participate. Um, and that is another factor that is is when it goes well, it's it's beautiful, and it it just it can be the icing on a cake. I think I think great marketing is introducing people to things they didn't realize that they wanted or didn't know about, mm. and the call to action is a pathway for someone to become involved or make whatever it is you're doing a part of their lives. And in that way, I think of it as a positive. You know, some people take a cynical view of marketing and advertising and whatnot. Um, I think, you know, so, and, and more broadly, sometimes profitability itself gets demonized. Uh, you know, and, and, and if it's framed as greed, et cetera, and you, you know, people talk about like crony capitalism more so, but I don't know if they realize they're referring to that. I think profits are healthy. They're good. Abundance is healthy and good. We Companies need to be profitable. They need to generate surplus to succeed and create a world where there are resources for things to exist. Um, and so I think the, the ultimately, and again, if you're measuring success, I suppose, financially, you'll find, I think, more financial success if you can build 
a product that scales. And, and again, I, the, the phrase is build once, sell twice. Um, that's really how major wealth is created. And, and the, the way to do that is to make, make it as easy as possible for people to get involved. The easier it is for someone to click the buy button, the easier it is for someone to send you money and invest, the more preparation you've done to just, hey, this is our pitch deck. This is our, let me give you my pitch. And you can check the last slide. It has our bank account information if you'd like to transfer funds. Um, yeah, I don't know if you'd actually want to put your bank account information in the slide, just, you know, <laughs> as the record, but like, you know, once yeah, people send are- Send all to me. <laughs> yeah, send, yeah, so like, yeah, right. So I, you know, but, but just as the point is the, the easier it is, the less friction, the more likely you'll find success. And in that sense, I like to think of start, like really building a company. And I feel like this is still something I'm evolving at. A company or a pitch deck, you're, it's almost like building a board game. Like imagine mm -hmm. you and some friends are going to sit down and play a board game. The, the, less, the less structure you have, the more likely that board game is probably not going to be fun and people are just going to randomly do what they think is best. But if you have a very structured game, people can learn the rules, they can start participating, right? Imagine yourself like a game designer. You're creating a pitch deck, you're starting a company. How do you want people to play it? And I think that's a healthy way to think about how folks are going to interact with what you're doing. Yeah. I love that analogy because it can also go too far. Like if you sit down and you're playing a new board game and you open the rule book and it's 35 pages. Too many rules. All text. Right. You're Your pitch deck's like, too wordy. I don't want to do it. I don't want to <laughs> yep. do it. I can't yep. focus on this right now. I don't want to do it. <laughs> so totally. it's, it is, it goes in both directions. That's, that's great. I love that analogy. There are a couple of questions in the chat here. So uh, Violet is asking, can you give us a quick example of a good pitch for a nonprofit? Um, and obviously I know that there are several different lengths of pitches and then maybe we can talk about that in some of the remaining minutes. But um, just as far as a structure, what do you typically go for when you have your nonprofit hat on? Yeah, you know, it's funny throughout this discussion, I've kind of uh, stated some of the little sentences we use in the gamers outreach pitch, you know, helping others level up is our tagline. We believe the world is better when kids can play. That's a very agreeable statement. Of course, mm -hmm. everyone, yeah, well, duh, like play is help, you know, play is healthy for kids. Of course. Well, kids in hospitals don't have access to play. Shouldn't they? Yeah. So again, it's like things that we try to find language and story mechanisms that people can get on board with. It's worth mentioning, some people might not get on board no matter how good your language is, and that's fine. Those aren't the people you're trying to reach. There are folks that we, not so much nowadays, but like when we were first starting and video games were less prevalent, less mainstream, there were some people who might say, this is a stupid cause. Video games don't belong in a hospital. Like kids shouldn't be playing video games at all. Screen time is the devil. Uh, ironically, that's kind of how we started. If you want to go back and look at our origin story, I kind of skipped over it, you know, for the sake of time. But um, we... I I came to the conclusion once I'm not trying to talk to those people. So I think if you're crafting a pitch for a nonprofit, the the first thing to do, I, first off, I like to take an approach where, and this is a preference, I don't like to guilt people into giving. I prefer to inspire them into giving. Mm. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, if you see the commercial where it's like the the really like an animal shelter, like the dogs are really sad and it's like, oh my gosh. And, and honestly, sometimes that's effective. Maybe it does work. But my preference would be, hey, here's maybe here's the maybe you do that to the extent that here's the world now. Here's the world as it could be. And if you are going to kind of show people like this, the sad part of things, which honestly, I think is mostly necessary in some cases, I would end with here's what it could be. Here's the world we're trying to build. Uh, some people might stop at look how sad the animals are. Please donate. I would modify that by saying, here are the sad animals. Here's what the animals look like when they've found someone to adopt them, when you've given and helped us to you know, save lives by supporting them at the shelter. Um, and here's how we're going to continue that on. So I think as a nonprofit, um, if I were to structure a basic uh, pitch for a nonprofit, uh, state the problem you're trying to solve, state the solution to that problem, 
maybe as a third prong, why you're the person to be working on it, why you care. And the fourth is ultimately, what's the big vision? What, what, does the, what does the world look like once you've accomplished your goal or if you're in the midst of accomplishing your goal? Some causes are indefinite. If you were to say, we want to, yeah, like I'll use the animal shelter as an example. We want to provide uh, you know, shelter for animals. Uh, there's probably going to be no end to the number of dogs and such that come through as an example, right? That need adopting and need fed, need staffing to support them. And so for you, the end result is getting a dog into a forever home, right? Um, in our case, I mean, well, gamers outreach is actually quite tangible. We're trying to get video games fully integrated with hospitals. So I, I, I kind of painted the picture earlier. We want to build a world where one day everyone looks back and asks, remember when hospitals didn't have video games? And there's little nuances, of course, like we might install video games broadly and maybe someday a kid wants to play on an iPad versus play an Xbox, like that's, that'll exist forever. But if, if, if we can get to this place where, hey, you know, Children's LA, dude, they've got a ton of video games that we can play while we're here. Like, let's go check these out. That's the world we're trying to build. So I, I think using that as just a, a very general outline is helpful. I'll also make a quick recommendation. There's a woman named Vic Harrison, who is one of the founders of an uh, organization called Charity Water. And she launched a fantastic, uh, I guess I'll call it a webinar series for nonprofits specifically that talks about nonprofit storytelling and fundraising. Mm -hmm. And it is worth it for sure. She is a, an incredible marketing person, an incredible creative person, and it's very worth uh, looking into her work. So that's great. Yep. Okay. Well, we are up against time. Um, thank you so much, Zach, for imparting your wisdom on us. This was really, really fantastic. Um, and, and you've hit on so many really salient points, I think, that, that make a, an interesting, compelling story and a, an emotional pull towards kind of collaborating in that solution. Um, and it's, you know, that's, that's all the element that makes for a fantastic pitch. So it's been great to see a little bit of your process um, and hopefully all of you in the audience uh, and all of you who are gonna watch this later, um, take some element of it and are able to adopt it within your own practice and within your own lives, because uh, there, was, there was a lot there. So thank you very much again, Zach. Uh, thank you, Ani. Uh, I'll hand it back over to you if there is any, any last minute comments or questions. And then I'm gonna put my info for KidsX in the chat, just in case anyone has any follow-up questions there. And perfect, Zach put his LinkedIn in the chat as well.